Hello everybody. Let's talk about the elaboration likelihood model, the ELM for short if you will. This is lecture at 2.3. A couple things going on here. We're going to talk a quick history of persuasion, uh, the role of Ohio State social psychology in that, uh, and we're also going to talk about preparing you for discussion board number four. So let's begin with the quick history of persuasion. We talked in the introduction about the role of World War II really facilitating the growth of social psychology in the United States and in the world. And part of that was the Hovland Group. And there's Carl Hovland. Uh, the Hovland Group was developing films. Uh, there was a seven film series called Why We Should Fight, uh, trying to explain why people should get involved in World War II. And that was a, a high level persuasive message being delivered by the government to uh, essentially an isolationist audience. So the, it was a hard road to get people on board. And some people might argue the videos weren't, you know, I mean, the, the films weren't all that. Uh, let's face it, what got us involved in World War II at the point we did was that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and people weren't going to put up with that. So uh, regardless of all the persuasion techniques, I think uh, the Japanese uh, gave us the ultimate in persuasion uh, when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Regardless, Hovland found through his research, they began to theorize that if you want to persuade someone, that is to get them to accept a message, they have to learn the message. So it's a very simple formula. Uh, the more that they learn the message, the better they learn the message, the more likely that they will be persuaded. And that's fine, and that idea floats around for a little while, but as other social psychologists are exposed to that idea, they may then question it. And, and Bill McGuire was one of those people who questioned this idea uh, severely and, and said, look, I understand that, that learning and accepting go along, but we have some people who aren't really capable of learning that easily, so they might not accept the message. And then we have people who may be highly intelligent and damned if they're really hard to persuade too, because they'll voice all these kind of counter arguments and they'll pick apart the persuasive message. And he said, if we, if we look at a bell-shaped curve of intelligence, then, then the people in the middle do pretty well with this learning and accepting theory. But the people who are of high intelligence, right, they learn the message but that doesn't necessarily mean they accept it. They may, may counter against it. And the people at the low end of the tail, those of, of lower intelligence, might not learn the message at all. So as we move along, as these ideas progress, then we're at Ohio State with, with Anthony Greenwald. And, and, and Tony Greenwald then hits us with this idea. It's elaboration. Here's the deal. Let's step aside from intelligence for the most part, etc. If you want someone to be persuaded, if you want them to change their mind, they're going to have to think about it. And that's elaboration. That is to think a lot, to elaborate on, on the idea. And the greater the elaboration, then perhaps the greater the persuasion. Well, we're doing pretty well there. And, and at Ohio State Social Psychology Program, Anthony Greenwald has a student, this guy named Rich Petty. And, and Rich Petty, of course, graduate student, is listening to these ideas. And he graduates, uh, gets his PhD in social psychology. He moves on to another research university in the Midwest and continues to think and formulate his ideas. He comes back to Ohio State as a, as a professor, right? Uh, well, probably, you know, as an assistant professor to begin with. And he teams up with John Cassiopo. And Petty and Cassiopo, uh, in, in Lazenby Hall there, just in case you were wondering where that was, in, in Lazenby Hall develop what they call the elaboration likelihood model. And the beauty of this model is that it says there's actually two routes to persuasion, and it really depends on your audience. And as a writing class, I'm going to remind you again and again and again, when you're going to do a piece of writing in that more conscious style of writing that I've been talking about, you need to consider your audience. Who am I writing this for? And part of considering your audience is what is their intelligence level? Also, what is their interest level? Uh, so, And those two things can kind of work hand in hand. What Petty and Cassiopo are saying, look, let's craft messages that can appeal to the widest range of audiences. That is, we can use a central route. That is where we talk about details. We talk about information. And they call this that we look at the message arguments. So these are highly well-crafted uh, 
arguments that, that contain data, that contain reason, that contain facts, figures, uh, that people like to process, especially people of high intelligence that will process, or people who are very interested in the message. Now, sometimes we are trying to persuade people who aren't really paying attention. I know that sounds strange, but we might then use peripheral cues. Uh, we, look at the, we look at the message cues, right? So let's, let's sell some toothpaste, and what are we going to do? Well, some people are going to look at toothpaste and they're going to say, well, does it fight cavities? How effective is it? Does it contain fluoride? Uh, does it contain more fluoride than the average type of toothpaste? Uh, what, what is its performance? I mean, has, have there been any clinical trials? And no, you're all probably already getting bored and say, oh my God, it's just toothpaste, right? But for people who like to base their decision making on central argument, that is thorough thought, the critical thinkers, then we really need to provide central arguments in our persuasive message. Now other people who don't really give a care, right, who are kind of uninvolved and, and or don't like to think too much in, in life, then we appeal to them using the peripheral route. And in selling toothpaste then, the person I want selling the toothpaste in the commercial is going to be in a lab coat because dentists wear lab coats, right? So I say, oh, look at that guy in a lab coat. He's probably a dentist and he's trying to sell me this toothpaste. Well, if the dentist likes it, I like it, and we're good to go. Uh, it, it's that simple, right? And, and notice that advertisements are filled with attractive people because attractive people are easier on the eye, so we like to look at them. And, and for toothpaste, everyone's going to have these sparkling white teeth, these unreally, you know, unreal white teeth. So we have two then paths to creating the persuasive argument that, that can appeal to multiple audiences. Now, when do we typically, on average, use the central route? Well, when we're motivated and able. So if we're motivated to process the information, if it's an important decision to us, then we're likely to, in fact, engage in processing central arguments. And in addition to this, when we're able. So if we're under time pressure, if we're distracted, if, if other things are going on, then we might not have the ability and the peripheral route is the better route at that point. So these two routes for persuasion, if we're going to craft, uh, if we're going to be skilled at crafting persuasive messages, we'll probably include both of those, right? So remember again, in this writing class, we always, when we sit down to write, think about what it is we're trying to do. And part of that then is who is my audience. So if the audience is, we believe to be of high motivation and high ability, then we better include central arguments within our persuasive message if we want to affect persuasion, right? which is probably what we want to do. But there's also going to be people reading this message likely, or viewing it, however you want to say it, listening to it, who are of relatively low ability and or low motivation. And then we want to make sure that we include things that will be attractive via the peripheral route. Uh, either way, we get to persuasion. But the idea was, and the, and the brilliance of Petty and Cassiopo's idea then, is that there are two routes to persuasion. Use both, right? And when you get right down to it, think about this. This is one of the probably, what, 10 most cited phenomenon in social psychology has grown out of the elaboration likelihood model. That's how big it is, and that's how huge this is. Uh, Petty operates with Fazio and Fujita, among others, at, at, at the graduate school in social psychology at Ohio State, GAP, the Group for Attitude and Persuasion. And, and these are some of the most sought after graduate student graduates um, across the country and across the world. Uh, they, they, that's how uh, big time that this is, right? So central components, components of the ELM then, let's take a look at them. Argument quality is one of the central components. Okay, so make sure that you have a high quality argument that stands the test of critical thinking. Um, peripheral cues though, for those who are less motivated, less able, make sure that the source delivering the message is attractive, make it appear that they have expertise, and notice that if I'm not thinking much and I just look over and I say, oh, this guy in the white coat is selling Colgate, and that's a lab coat, and he's a dentist, good, all right, I'm, a, I'm on board, right, because he's an expert. I'm not thinking much, so my stereotype of white lab coat equals dentist, which equals expertise, and I'm, I'm on a roll. Not the critical thinking approach, right? The message appearance and the style. Make it an attractive message uh, that, that will impact our audience. 
Central components require more thinking, and that's kind of a downside. And, and we live in a world that's, you know, we call it the soundbite world, and I'm a fan of Twitter, right? So I'm on Twitter, Dr. underscore Mark, and you got 256 characters, right, to mess with. You can't say a whole lot with 256 characters. How many of you are embracing TikTok? Right, 30 seconds, boom. Uh, it doesn't allow necessarily uh, for... Uh, presenting central arguments necessarily. If it does, a very narrow and, and very precise central arguments. The peripheral cues require very little thought, and that's kind of the advantage there. But what we find is that people who persuaded, who are persuaded using the central route, it requires more. It, it, it then yields more lasting persuasion, and, and that's a true benefit that they internalize the message, and that message becomes part of their world and their thinking. Right, the persuasion is less permanent with the peripheral route, so it's a more fickle route to persuasion, and people are often easily persuaded off uh, by another peripheral argument. So, we got back to motivation and ability. What equals motivation in this context? Well, if it's personally relevant. So, to the extent that I uh, can find an audience where I know my message is personally relevant, then I probably can engage in more central type arguments, right? And maybe that's one of the things I need to do is sell the idea first that, hey, this matters to you and let me tell you why this matters. That way I increase the personal relevance in the message and then come in with the central argument that's more likely to be attended to. People are high in need for cognition, and this was uh, a measure that grew out of the Petio and Cassiopo lab to help facilitate their understanding of their participants and how they responded to messages. People are high in need for cognition, that is people who like to think are more likely to attend to central arguments. People who are low in need for cognition are more likely to respond to peripheral arguments, all else being equal. Accountability, and this is something that came out of my lab with Dr. Tetlock my first three years here. Uh, one of his former graduate students, long before me, was Jennifer Lerner, who's now at Carnegie Mellon. Or no, I think she's at Berkeley now. Regardless, uh, she wrote this great article, one of my favorite titles, and she was working with Tetlock at the time, Accounting for the Effects of Accountability. And what happens when we make people accountable, that is, they believe they'll have to explain their reasoning. They pay more attention to the information uh, so that they will be better able to explain it. Another accountability manipulation, we have quizzes in this class, don't we? I know. What an asshole, I give you quizzes. That's to make you accountable for the readings. Pure and simple, right? It's an accountability manipulation. So, now the ability section, what do we have? Well, distraction. People are distracted. In fact, then their ability to process central arguments is diminished, so peripheral cues might be better. If, if you're thinking that your audience is going to be in a situation where they're likely to be distracted, you better rely to a greater extent on peripheral cues. Right. Uh, next up is intelligence and, and the ability to process a message. Imagine the information that we're getting surrounding COVID. Uh, it, when we start looking at the research articles and, and how does COVID operate and how do we defend against COVID, etc., uh, some of those articles can be pretty daunting. They, they push the limits of our knowledge, especially those of us who maybe didn't study a lot of biology or genetics. I have to struggle through those, but I find it very important to understand so I engage in the struggle because of its high personal relevance, right? And I'm also high need cog, so that that helps there. Uh, other people you may not be able to then persuade uh, because they might be of relatively low intelligence and not able to process the argument at all. Uh, if someone doesn't really understand what genetics is in the first place, uh, using a genetic-based <laughs> message is, is not going to be successful in persuading them. And then time pressure. And to the extent we're under time pressure, then we may take shortcuts, processing shortcuts, and the peripheral cues weigh more heavily than the central arguments. And let's talk about need for cognition for just a minute. How much does one like to think? Yeah, it's pretty much that simple. Makes a diff big difference in the approach one takes to designing an appeal. So when you're writing, think about it. To what extent is my audience high need cog or low need cog? And that's going to push you towards central argument versus peripheral argument. Uh, and you can take the need for cognition yourself. I put it there in module two, so there's a, a link to a PDF. And you just sit down and you can assess your own need for cognition. It's relatively easy to score. 
uh, the instructions are right there. And they've been using that in the Petty Lab since, oh my God, the beginning of time, what, since the 1980s. So let's get to uh, discussion board four. And this is the way this works. Now, some of these discussion boards, right, I'm asking you to post something and then to reply. And anytime we have a post and reply discussion board in the week, then you know that the deadline for the post is midnight, 11.59 p.m. Wednesday. The deadline for the response is 11.59 Friday. So you got to post on time so that other people have the two-day window to respond. Okay, so we're in this together. Let's make sure we get that done. Uh, now, what are you going to do for discussion board four? Find an advertisement. It can be video, can be print, whatever. Post it on the discussion board. I want you to, the ad should demonstrate both central and peripheral routes. So when you're searching for an ad, be kind to your fellow classmates and find ads where you can spot both central and peripheral, right? Central arguments and peripheral cues. Okay. And then reply to someone else's posted ad. So reply to somebody else's, point out two elements of the ad that are designed as peripheral elements and two elements that are designed as central arguments and point them out and explain why. So you can see that it's not a long response. It could be, you know, four kind of moderate sentences when you get right down to it. This is this and I call it central because. This is peripheral and I call it peripheral because, right? So just be clear in that, explain your reasoning for all four elements you selected to describe in the ad. Okay? So there we go. We've talked a brief history of persuasion and how social psychologists' ideas evolve over time, building on each other's ideas, and, and, and then how to apply the, the, uh, the ELM to our own writing and, and how to unpack an advertisement in terms of the two dimensions. Uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, let's get nostalgic here for a minute. I sure miss this view. This is the picture from the second floor office I have in psychology. Uh, I haven't been back to the office in spring break and I miss it. I can stand up and look out the window and see you guys, see folks milling about, etc. over there at Coons Hall. And it's just kind of kind of homesick of Oaken, you know. I miss school. I don't know about you guys, but I miss the campus. And I'm, uh, So anyway, uh, that's enough for now. We'll pick it up on the next one.